Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Marine Money webinar series. I'm your host, John Chair, and today's topic, lending and investing in US maritime assets, will be run by none other than our very own Matt McClary. And joining him in this discussion will be Charlie Papavisas, partner and chair of the maritime uh, practice at the law firm Winston & Strawn, and Kirk Phillips, CEO at Wintrust Commercial Finance. Now, before I hand it over to Matt, here are a couple of tips for those who are new to our webinar. Um, first of all, you will all be muted to ensure audio control. During this webinar, you'll have the opportunity to ask questions to the panelists. This is the whole reason why we do this live, so please take advantage of this. Um, to ask a question, simply enter your question in the text box um, that says questions. You'll see an example of that on my screen right now. Once you submit a question, I will receive them and send them over to Matt, who will, throughout the session, incorporate your questions into the discussion. Um, Finally, if you want to collapse your menu to see this fantastic talent that we have today, simply click on the orange slash red box with the arrow in it, and that should collapse that menu. So now, without any further ado, I would like to hand it over to Matt. Matt, Ooh, take it Great. away. John, uh, thank you very much, and uh, welcome, everyone. It's uh, uh, We're just delighted to have you with us, and um, it's, uh, it's not like being together in New York and other places around the world, but we found that the, the webinars have been a great way to stay connected and to sort of uh, you know, keep in touch. Uh, today, we're going to talk about investing and lending in U.S. maritime assets. And um, for everyone who's registered for this event, uh, you know this is a very important topic, and I think it comes at a, at a very good time to be having the discussion. And I'm really just delighted to have uh, Charlie and Kirk with us today to, to share kind of you know, what they're seeing in the market, what their workflow looks like, what the kind of deal environment is, and, and also, you know, talk a little bit about the future and what the opportunities are. We're going to cover a lot of ground today. Um, this is a big topic and, you know, we're not going to be able to get to everything, but um, I want to encourage you, you know, if you have things you'd like to follow up on afterwards, please feel free to contact me directly and I can kind of point you in the right direction or, or answer any questions that I can. Um, the goal with these webinars is really our, the goal that, that we bring to everything we do at Marine Money, which is to create an environment where you know, professionals with, a, with an interest in this particular business can, can sort of come together and exchange views and learn from each other and kind of expand the network. And, and I think above all, you know, spark some ideas and some energy. And I feel like that's something that is, um, it's one of the key features and I think it's something that's especially important now when we can't be together physically. So I, I hope you will um, kind of develop some ideas uh, from this webinar. Um, so we're going to kick this off with a slide uh, just to sort of get us in the mood. And I'm, I'm curious to see what uh, Kirk and Charlie are up to these days. So uh, why don't we start with Kirk? Can you uh, play uh, Mad Libs here? Fill in the blanks. Sure. Uh, let me, uh, let me, let me uh, interrupt you, Kirk, quickly to say that the last question um, does not refer to who you wish to be president. It refers to who you think will be president. So this is not a political question. It's more of a odds making question. I like that safe harbor. Um, so I'm presently located in Valley View, Texas, which is north of Dallas. Um, during the work from home, I've discovered that I need a bigger home office. Uh, <laughs> my favorite TV show has been, uh, I don't watch a lot of TV, but when I do, it's Marvel Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. Uh, okay. if, I could go, if I could go anywhere today, I think I would go back to the mountains where it's a lot cooler than the 100 degrees in here. Uh, I like working from home because, number one, I get more done and I get to spend a little more time with the family, don't have the commute. I think COVID will be with us until, well, I think it'll be with us forever. We just need to find a vaccine so we can manage it. Um, resume business travel, um, you know, when possible. I uh, really miss getting out in the field and seeing people. Safe Harbor here, next U.S. president will be Kanye West. <laughs> going, for, going for the youth vote. <laughs> Kirk, any, any kids move back into the house? One. House got okay. smaller. All right. Hence the, the new home office. Uh, Charlie, you're up. Uh, I'm in actually in my office today. Been in three times since March uh, in Washington, D.C. Um, during work from home, I discovered I can get life every day of the week. Um, my favorite TV show is the Premier League. I'm so glad first the Bundesliga came back and now the Premier League. If I could go anywhere today, 
I'd probably just pretty much go anywhere other than um, I like working from home because it's been sort of a preview of retirement. Um, I think COVID will be here with us forever. Uh, I think it's going to be like measles, even if we have an effective uh, vaccine. Uh, planning to resume business travel early next year, hopefully. Uh, next U.S. president refused to answer because I don't want to jinx it. Okay, <laughs> we're gonna we're gonna get into the politics a little later, Charlie. You're not uh, you're not quite out of the woods. Um, so let's um so we have a, a great group of people that are registered for this event. It's sort of a, a mix of people who are uh, very involved in this market, and then also a number of people who are kind of new to it and exploring it. And Charlie, I would be grateful if you would um, just kind of give us a quick overview when we talk about the U.S. maritime market. Uh, there's some nuances to this. Could you just quickly kind of set the stage and tell us uh, what that encompasses? Sure. The, well, the U.S. the U.S. flag fleet is engaged in domestic trade and foreign trade, and the domestic trade part is what most people refer to as the Jones Act trade. The foreign trade part are vessels that are in international competition. They mainly rely on government promotion programs to be able to survive commercially, maritime security program, cargo preference, et cetera. Um, the Jones Act um, uh, industry per se is really a lot of sub industries, uh, whether you're talking about the vessels that were patch in the Gulf of Mexico or harbor tugs or inland barge business or the non-contiguous trade serving Alaska, Hawaii, Puerto Rico, and so on. Uh, all, all of those trades, um, as I said, really are, are are their industries onto themselves. Okay, that's that's great. And so um, we're going to talk about foreign ownership of U.S. maritime assets a little bit later. Um, Kirk, just to kind of uh, shift gears, you know, we've known each other for uh, a long time. I think it was almost 20 years ago we worked on a transaction together uh, on foreign flag bulk carriers. So you, you've spent a lot of time in sort of U.S. and international uh, marine finance markets. Can you talk a little bit about kind of your business, what you've been doing the last few months? Um, kind of what the, you know, Charlie describes a market that's quite um, broad. I mean, you're talking about assets that are doing all kinds of different things. How to, tell us about your your world and kind of how you look at it. Sure, Matt. And, um, you know, since since coming over to Wintrust, uh, which is a U.S.-based bank, we've kind of focused our, our market on the domestic Jones Act trade. Um, and so what we're seeing opportunity in right now, certainly uh, over the last couple of years, has been uh, uh, doing quite a bit in the transportation sectors, both the brown water as well as uh, some of the coastwise trades uh, with some of the product tankers and things. Construction, dredging, uh, we've seen a lot of opportunity in there. Uh, again, our infrastructure needs a lot of work. You're seeing projects going on uh, there. We've done very little um you know in actually the oil field sector you know we used to be a big player of that previously but since the 14 15 downturn and now with uh what's going on in the uh the politics of the oil markets you know we just haven't seen quite as many opportunities in the offshore uh not to say that we wouldn't play there if we see a, a resurgence but um but generally the transportation side has been uh been uh, our, our real focus of late okay and when you look at your loan portfolio, are you, I mean, does that reflect kind of what you just described? I mean, is that, is there, are there sectors that you are, you're staying away from the oil, the kind of offshore oil stuff, are there sectors that you are putting, I mean, that you like in particular now? Well, I mean, you know, again, what I described are the areas that, that you know, we have invested in. I mean, uh, right now, Maritime represents about 11 and a half, 12 percent of our book. Um, you know, and again, a predominance of those are either in transportation or construction assets. Okay, gotcha. And when you think about, um, you know, when you look at sort of the U.S. marine financing business, Kirk, and you know, you've done, you've spent time in sort of foreign flag and U.S. How, I mean, how how would you compare them? Like, do you prefer? I mean, Wind Trust is more of a domestic bank, I guess. How how would you compare those two? Uh, kind of areas of, of lending. And the reason I ask is, you know, there are a number of foreign lenders that, that we see that are interested in participating in this market. And we do see them coming up on certain transactions, like American Shipping was one that, uh, mm -hmm. you know, there were a bunch of European banks. What would be your sort of 
how would you describe the market and what would be your guidance to foreign investors? Well, I mean, you know, playing on both sides of, of the fence here, what I find is in, in, in the U.S. market and the U.S. lenders, uh, as compared to foreign banks, foreign institutions, uh, maritime lending, there's very few, there are some, but very few that are, are real specialists in the industry. Um, whereas a lot of foreign institutions tend to have whole departments from origination, underwriting, doc and funding, all those sorts of things. So they have a lot of knowledge. My point in saying that is, you know, on some of the transactions we've worked with with other domestic lenders, not only are you having to underwrite a particular transaction, but you're also having to do an education, you know, to get those lenders, you know, kind of up to speed with not only the market, the assets, the dynamics, um, you know, the, the, the documentation and legal side of it. So it takes a little bit longer. Um, again, there are some institutions that have specialized departments, but but I would say to foreign lenders coming into this market, if you're working with domestic lenders, you know, you're going to have to set aside a little bit of time for education um, and, 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 and helping those lenders get comfortable. And, and how do the, when you see foreign lenders coming into the U.S. market, I mean, is it through like a syndication effort by guys like you or how, how does that actually happen? Well, again, and, and Charlie can address some of, some of the, the, you know, more of the nuances of the legal side of this. But again, because of the Jones Act and some of the, the protections that are in, in place, you know, the biggest requirement is qualifying as a U.S. citizen to invest in this marketplace. Now, you know, example, the transaction that you you mentioned previously, uh, again, that that was a transaction where the investment made by the foreign lenders were to an entity that then had a long-term bareboat charter to a U.S. Uh, qualified citizens. So that was their means of entering into that transaction and investing in those assets. So, yeah. Um, yeah, that's, I mean, you bring up a good point. And Charlie, I'd like to maybe just turn it over to you to, to talk about that. I mean, over the years, we've seen a number of, um, you know, foreign entities participating to various degrees in the market. Names that kind of jump to mind are obviously Maersk, uh, Wallenius, I remember Ellison, the Greek tanker company, built some ships. How do you, um, when you talk about ownership restrictions, how do you kind of think about that? And can you kind of walk us through what, you know, what they are? Yeah, well, the, well all those examples are with regard to vessels and essentially the foreign trade. I mean, Maersk, Maersk is not in the Jones Act. The Melanius is not in the Jones Act. Um, you, you know, you when but when you're talking, then and, and there are citizenship requirements you have to concern yourself in the foreign trade as well but they're not near as they are for the Jones Act. And in the Jones Act, you, you, I think you have to differentiate equity from, from lending. So, um, because the Jones Act itself, the citizenship requirements focus on ec direct equity, current equity participation. They don't focus on warrants and options, for example, they don't focus on loans so much. So a foreign bank, for example, can lend and take back a mortgage on a Jones Act vessel pretty much without a problem. Uh, there's repossession, uh, foreclosure type issues that, that might arise. And, and that's why I agree with Kirk, but that's, that's where the education process comes in. Because you tell a foreign bank, well, hey, you can't just repossess this vessel and operate it in the Jones Act. You, you can't do that. You'll have, this is, these, here are the steps you'll have to undertake to, um, to enforce your mortgage. Um, but, once, but, you know, that, but, but many become comfortable with that. Now on the equity side, on on private equity, uh, you know that's a that's a that's a whole game onto itself. I mean, it's something we we do a lot in, uh, and it's not a new game. I mean, BP and Shell pioneered some of the concepts that are still around today, 40, 50 years ago. I mean, it's not it's not a lot of this is not is not new. So um, I'm I have a, call, a, a question from the audience. Um, what can I tell my clients, foreign lenders and investors that want to come in as mezzanine? Uh, it, I mean, how are you, Charlie, can you talk a little bit about where the foreign lenders are participating and if they're not um, like necessarily in secured pieces or how that's working? Well, that's not, well, I mean, how, how, however, it is commercially appropriate because um, the, the, as I said, be secured. If they don't want to be secured, uh, or if they, or if, or uh, that's not appropriate given the situation, that's completely a commercial question. 
Um, how much that's happening in the Jones Act today, I'm not sure I have a good handle on that. Kirk might. Um, but but you might you might see it like in a structured transaction where you know uh, the equity could be non-U.S. if it's if it's non I guess if it's non-control. I mean, you could see it in like a structured financing setting, I suppose. Yeah, well, I mean, it's 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 difficult to talk about this. Instances, but it, yes, the normal rule is non-citizens are list are limited to 25% direct investment. Um, but but you don't you don't need to know know that when companies are coming out of restructuring, uh, whether that's Tidewater or whatever, you know le when lenders become equity and many of the lenders are foreign and somehow they that's all worked out uh, with yeah. this 25% yeah. limit. Well, how is that? Well, the lenders take up all the 25% and then they get warrants and the warrants generally are not counted yeah. for purposes of the direct the, the direct equity test. The, you know, the, the, the problem with warrants, of course, is that they don't vote and they don't get current distributions. Mm -hmm. That's those are issues right. that have been that have been substantial issues in many of these restructurings. Yeah. Yeah. Although it does. It sounds like there are creative solutions that that can be developed. Right. I mean, it seems like, you know, these things are getting done. So that's. Yeah, no, they, that's and, the, and the market. Yeah, no, the markets, the market's pretty. Uh, stable. I mean, the interpretations are pretty stable. But for example, in American commercial lines, American commercial barge lines, restructuring the Coast Guard, and um, this this decision is on right, so anybody can go look at it. Um, you know, went a little bit further in terms of permitting uh, anti-dilution protections to the warrant holders uh, than they did before. Um, you know, because there's a there's a great temptation amongst lawyers to try and find a way to make distributions possible, calling them distributions, and the Coast Guard's kind of seen it all, uh, and that hasn't worked. But uh, but they but they but they moved a little bit in the direction of protecting warrant holders. Yeah. Okay. Kirk, I got a question here for you. Uh, Kirk, will you consider uh, providing capital to non-U.S. companies? And you look at it if it's if it's the right deal, obviously. Right, right. Yeah, I mean, again, what we're primarily focused on is the the assets location, you know, because we're a domestic lender. So, you know, we want those assets in the U.S. Um, you know, we'll do a little bit in Canada. We've done a little bit. Again, the couple of instances where we've invested in, with assets going overseas have been very unique circumstances part of the part of the assets that are part of the u.s government support programs in the uh in the maritime right. sector but right now you know we really don't have uh an appetite or a mandate to go out and do foreign source assets yeah just to, just to kind of um follow on to that you know the, the money supply has obviously increased dramatically in the last few months um, I think it's been absolutely unprecedented, four or five trillion dollars. Has that made its way into your market? I mean, how are market conditions for, for lending on these kinds of assets? Are prices uh, dropping or, or, you know, who's sort of controlling that market, the borrowers or the lenders? Yeah, well, I mean, you know, again, there's a, we haven't seen a lot of movement in asset prices. I, I mean, I don't think the stimulus has really moved assets uh, as much for the domestic market um you know because because again that's not really where the money was focused the focus was more employment and and rather than uh than those sorts of things you know what we've seen in in, in as you know in the maritime market the capex spend is not something that you turn on and turn off quickly yeah. um and so a lot of projects that we we're involved with uh pre-pandemic uh are continuing uh, again they're getting looked at a lot harder um and, and scrubbed down um, and then, of course, you've got ongoing capex spend uh, just for maintenance and operations, and so we're still seeing opportunities there. So I wouldn't say um, you know it's had a big impact on the pricing. Now, um, given what's going on, I certainly wouldn't want to be selling assets into this market until we could have a little more visibility into uh, into the economic recovery and the impact there, uh, because you know on, a, on just the sell side on a valuation side and, and working with my asset management team you know we have seen a depression you know in some of the prices for things that have gone to market yeah okay so I'm gonna I think I'm gonna kind of rip up the script here because I'm getting like a, a lot of questions from the audience and I want to do my best to to sort of get through them um, 
Here's a question for Charlie. Uh, any views on 100% mortgage financing from a non-citizen if the lender takes 25% equity but covenants not to participate in the management? There's, um, the way I describe to some clients the whole Jones Act citizenship analysis is a camel's back analysis, except the camel is behind a curtain. So every time you throw something over the curtain, you don't even know if the camel's back is sagging or not. <laughs> but, at, but at a certain point, you're going to break the camel's back, adding non-citizen elements. And, and uh, lawyers don't make that judgment call. And investors and lenders don't either or the Maritime Administration. So at the end of the day, um, that probably can work, but what else is going on is very important. It's a, it's very much a facts and circumstances, all-encompassing type analysis. And as I said, at the end of the day, the Coast Guard does thumbs up or thumbs down. And fortunately, there's a process to go to the Coast Guard in, on an informal basis, and in effect, get sort of a no action letter, like the SEC yeah. gives, um, you know, in a very similar, you know, he, and again, usually done on a term sheet basis, um, and um, and that's the normal process. So, so the look, deals are being done. Deals have been done. Deals will be done. Um, that some are aggressive and some are not, and it just depends on the circumstance. Yeah, yeah. I remember. Uh, I think Boscalis had a dredging presence in the U.S. for some time, right, Charlie? Had, I don't know if that's still. They, they had a well. They had a they had a very special problem, and and being and being in a position of having some Dutch clients, they still remember Boscalis. I have people from Holland tell me all the time, hey, we can't invest in the Jones Act, Boscalis. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah. They, that, that left a very bad taste in many people's minds, even though really it didn't, it was a very unique situation. Yeah, I mean, you can't get too far in this topic without sort of thinking about or talking about the, pol the politics involved. Um, and we certainly don't have time to sort of get into that on this call, but I might ask, uh, Charlie, um, has the Trump administration, like what has been their effect on U.S. maritime industries? And do you think that would be any different with a different administration? Well, the Trump administration has been basically hands off. Um, you know, there was a hope uh, that it would that would not be the case at the outset, but that's been what's actually happened, uh, you know, and that's probably had good and bad uh, effects. I can give you one bad one from the U.S. flag perspective, which is that the Agency for International Development and some other organizations have basically drifted off in terms of complying with cargo preference because no one's there to tell them to come back to the, you know, to square one and follow the law. Um, and that's, and, and, but at the same time, there hasn't been any genuine interference in the Jones Act or anything like that, but there hasn't been anything supportive either. There hasn't been, I mean, right now with COVID response, there's lots of proposals to either reimburse carriers for PPE and testing or provide grants of some kind or loans, you know, and that's all still in the mix, but, but the Trump administration per se is not really involved in that dialogue. Yeah. Okay, which, as you say, I mean, that's surprising in some respects, but um, uh, a Kirk, question for you, uh, someone interested in potentially doing business, uh, what is your sort of ticket size guidance, uh, minimum, maximum, ideal size? Sure. Well, I mean, you know, we, we kind of go to market with a five to $50 million uh, uh, position. Um, you know, again, we, we have done deals that were larger where we brought in syndicate partners. Um, but you know when we when we were looking at that and sizing those opportunities, um, and again a lot of that sizing depends upon structure, credit quality, assets, so forth. Um, you know as we determine our whole position. But we've got a we've got a strong cadre of partners that we work with on larger deals and bring them in. Um, you know we're we're up front with the clients, letting them know. And again that gets back to a little bit of that education process because. Um, you know, again, we've got some partners that have worked with us on, on maritime deals. And so they, they um, you know, we've kind of gone through the process of helping to educate them and getting them up to speed. And so it's making the process a lot smoother. Um, so any, again, from terms right now, you know, these are long lived assets. However, given where we are in the, um, in the uh, interest rate cycle, 
you know, we're trying to keep things uh, on a little bit on the shorter side right now, uh, you know, 84 months, 60, 84 months uh, to balloons. Now, amortizations can obviously match up, marry up with the uh, the life of the asset or the project. But but again, we're, we're just trying to keep an eye on the exposure to uh, interest rate risk on our book. Yeah, so five, five, five to 50, five, six, seven year deals. Um, Charlie, I guess this one is for you. Um, considering um, pandemics, famine, trade war, infrastructure, Exim Bank, et cetera, do you have a view on the sort of mid to long-term outlook for cargo preference programs? Um, well, there's the well, question, the, just to, for the audience. The question relates to uh, you know government-backed uh, funding of uh, cargos that would be allocated to U.S. flag vessels. Is that right? Yeah. Well, that well, the, since 1904, in the case of military cargos, the United States, when it ships, the U.S. government, of course, is a big shipper. Uh, at, at some points, it, maybe even today, it's been the largest shipper in the world. So it moves a lot of stuff around the world. And it reserves all of military cargoes and 50% of civilian cargoes to qualified U.S. flag vessels. Um, there is there is a move at the moment to make that 50% requirement 100%. That's occurred. That move has occurred in, other, in times in the past. Uh, you know, there's there's opposition within the government. You know, an individual agency. I mentioned AID or USDA or NASA or whatever. If they ship something and they have to pay a little more for it to put it on a U.S. flag vessel, that comes out of their budget. So they're sort of natural enemies of cargo preference. Um, but anyway, I mean, is it is, is what's the future of it? Um, you know, it, it, in a sense, it's pretty solid. Uh, the, but at the same time, during this COVID period since March, uh, one of the first things DOD did is they put a stop order on moving units around the world. And that was that's a disastrous cargo drop for the the U.S. flag carriers that do that kind of thing, move tanks and trucks and Humvees and MRAPs around the world. But you know, yeah. but that'll end. I mean, if it's, it's almost certainly going to end before the end of the year. There's there's activities going to uh, have to. There's going to be a lot of catch up activity and then back to normal at some point. Yeah, and I, actually, I would think there'd be a tremendous backlog of cargo to get moved. Uh, okay, so oh, the up, unit, right? you know, the U.S. is always moving units around the world. They try and move them as units, in other words, with their equipment. Uh, the people move by plane, but the you know all the all the stuff moves in a ship, and uh, and and they're rotated. So there's there's a constant movement of stuff around the world, even when yeah. we're not active in a, in a in a conflict anywhere. Yeah, Kirk, um, we're kind of bouncing around a little bit, but I, I'm just we're getting a lot of questions, and I want to address them all if I can. Um, it, the U.S. maritime asset, um, you know, market is pretty big. I mean, we have obviously three large coasts, the largest, I think, inland water system in the world. Um, but yet, you describe a a market for marine finance that's kind of, um, you know, not not super organized. It sounds like. I mean, there you describe sort of generalist banks and a lot of kind of local, regional funding. Why do you why do you think that is? I mean, compared to the international market where you have kind of these uh, larger specialized teams that are really focused on this uh, these types of assets? Yeah, I mean, it's a great question, um, Matt. I think part of it has to do with, um, you know, the, 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 the fragmentation of the industry. I mean, you know, again, you look back 20 years ago when you and I were first, uh, you know, uh, working together. I mean, you look at the number of carriers out there just in the domestic, you know, transportation, inland waterway market, and how much consolidation has gone on there. But a lot of those companies started out with a local player or a regional player or something like that. Um, you know, so while, uh, you know, and again, we've got this large inland waterway, um, you know, that has a lot of different places for companies to operate out of. So it's, it, like I say, it's very fragmented. Um, I think, you know, and again, it's it's somewhat limited uh, from the standpoint of, you know, there's just so many barges, there's so many, you know, so many uh, product carriers that the domestic market can support. And so, um, you know, for an institution to create a whole department around just focusing on Jones Act assets, um, you know, may not be in their the, the the best use of their resources, if you will. Mm -hmm. So, 
I think a lot of these relationships that were started, you know, 20, 30 years ago have kind of remained with some of the, you know, individuals and institutions they work with. Okay. Yeah. If I, if I can, Matt, yeah. if I can add, um, you know, and, and the larger U.S. banks used to be in this market and uh, Kirk, you, you've seen it. The large banks aren't in this market anymore, by and large. Mm -hmm. I mean, D of A, uh, you know, GECC when it was around. Um, mm -hmm. You know the, the 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 consolidation made a made a huge difference, but also you know it's it's a highly specialized market it requires a lot of specialized knowledge, and uh, you know it just wasn't a market that you know generated the right returns. Yeah, I mean it's it is actually similar to what we're seeing in the international ship finance market, which is that um, the sort of mainstream traditional commercial banks are um, doing. Uh, less of the overall volume and we're seeing more non-banks um equipment finance i mean the shadow banks goes by various names but we're seeing organizations like that taking a larger percentage of the business is that something you're saying here as well kirk like um less commercial bank with like traditional deposit commercial banks and more um private equity backed and non-regulated lenders yeah, I, I think so. I think so. And it, it, and again, um, you know, some of the larger banks and institutions have long memories. Uh, you know, if you look at what, you know, has happened in, say, the inland market uh, back post uh, ITC credit and the collapse that happened there. If you look at the oil and gas market, you know, some of these markets are really subject to boom and bust cycles. Um, and and that's hard for you know a, a, a regulated entity to kind of get used to and, and and manage through over time. So yeah, I think you're seeing a lot more. You know, and, and Charlie, you bring up a great point. GECC was one of the big lenders. Certainly, ITT. You know, we were a big lender as a as a uh, non-regulated entity into the marketplace. Um, so I think I think it is an opportunity for those institutions that are not in the regulated space. Um, and, and we're seeing that with private equity. We're seeing it with a few independents mm -hmm. that are out there. And, and again, those are those are good partners for us from an origination side to get you know to get married up with. Yeah, no, I think it's it does it does make sense. What we see on the international market is that the risk is, um, I would say, sliced a little more um, surgically. So you're mm -hmm. getting you know capital and returns are actually getting, I would say, priced um, more. Um, accurately to reflect risk um, i'm going to take a, a quick break we're, we're actually sort of getting toward the end but um the questions way laid us a little bit so um if everyone if you guys are going to hang on for a few more minutes i'd like to keep going uh for the audience if you need to drop off uh thanks for being with us um so i want to talk to you guys about um two more topics before we're done one is um Restructuring in in the Gulf and offshore, Kirk. You mentioned that you don't have a lot of exposure to that. Is can you talk? And, and Charlie, this might be in your purview as well. Obviously, the oil patches. There's like a resetting of of a lot of things. How do you? What are the current conditions there, and how do you see it playing out? Sure. Well, I mean, Matt, as you know, I I, I love the offshore oil and gas industry. Um, over the past 20, 30 years, done a lot of business down there, and really like that marketplace. But but certainly since the downturn of 14, 15, um, you know, um, you know that that certainly put a damp on the on the market. And then now with the current you know geopolitical situation around the energy markets, um, you know, it's it's really put stress on on that marketplace. Or, you know, again, you go down to the Gulf Coast, um, you can walk across, you know. Uh, uh, harbors and never get your feet wet from from all the vessels that are tied up and stacked. Um, you know, there was just again, this is an industry that when things are good, people are building. It takes a long time to build the assets, and unfortunately, uh, when it downturns, you can't stop those ad assets coming into the marketplace. So, so you know, do I think the market will recover? Yes, there is. You know, again, the majors are still. You know, conventional oil um, is 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 got a foundational position in our in our energy stream. Uh, you know, with the on on uh, onshore fracking as being kind of a string producer, but we just haven't seen the fundamentals yet, and so that that warrants us going back into that marketplace. Um, I liken it a little bit to the airline industries. You know, when they're doing really good, they're building a lot of assets, they're taking a lot of debt on. Now all of a sudden, the market's collapsed out from underneath them, and yet they still got to service that debt. So. 
we're seeing what's going on. You know, the companies yeah. that are are going through restructurings and, and and shedding the debt and trying to right size their balance sheet. They have to do it, yeah. and some of these assets have to leave the market and never come back. And and you know, we're starting to hear talk of that happening. Yeah, I mean, that's always the the sort of double edged sort of the restructuring is that you might get a new buyer with a lower cost basis who puts the same assets into the market to compete against the people who didn't get restructured <laughs> but it's uh it, it will be interesting to see i want to finish up on a topic that has really uh captured the uh, hearts and and minds of of many uh which is which is offshore wind um you know we are the largest energy consumer in the world uh you know we have a, quite a lot of coastline we have a fair amount of wind um and we have a culture and a legal system that seems that to not be supportive of pipelines. We saw Dominion just this week uh, sort of abandon pipeline plans and, and sold some assets to Berkshire Hathaway. So I, maybe this is first for you, Charlie. Um, wind has the potential to be something very exciting on many different levels, right? Um, and it checks a lot of the boxes that you guys have talked about today. I mean, it's it's infrastructure, it's clean energy, it's it's a lot of things. But I mean, we've been hearing about this for a long time. And I just wonder if you could sort of, both of you, but maybe Charlie, you could start, just kind of bring us up to speed on wind, offshore wind in the US, the CapEx that would be required, how companies like Orsted and others would be involved and sort of how this thing is gonna play out in the next few years. Sure. Um... Well, everybody, I, I would expect everybody remembers the Cape Wind project. Uh, whenever I give a presentation about offshore wind, the first one of the first things I do is I put up on a map where Cape Wind was, was supposed to be. And it was within sight of Martha's Vineyard, Nantucket, and Hyannis. And I said, which, which smart person would decide to put the first big wind farm within sight of these three places? And are we surprised that that was problematic. So so that left a bad taste to, for some people, but 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 that's all that was. I mean, the projects that are ongoing now in various development stages are 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 massive and they're all up and down the East Coast, North Carolina all the way to New York. Uh, you, people like Equinor, companies like Equinor have paid a lot of money for leases, uh, for lease areas, not even leases. Um, all the major players, all the major developers in the world, you mentioned Orsted, all the major developer, developers in the world, by and large, are in the U.S. market. Uh, if they don't already have lease, leases, they're, they're, they're hunting for them. Um, and, and, and the only issue is regulatory. The only issue is how fast these things can be permitted by the U.S. government, uh, because they're all in federal waters, and so that's the way it's done. Um, it's it's a tremendous opportunity to just generally, but it's it's a tremendous opportunity for the vessel industry because a lot of uh, uh, vessel equipment, a lot of vessels are going to be built, Jones Act vessels, crew transfer vessels in particular, special operation vessels or SOVs. Um, uh, some CTVs have already been built or ordered. Um, you know, we're talking about at the lower end, the CTVs are you know five, ten million dollar vessels. Uh, perfect for the smaller yards in the United States. The SOVs, 50, $100 million vessels. Uh, we're talking about very sophisticated, a lot of habitation, excellent station keeping, uh, walk to work type vessels. Um, you know, that's, it's, a, it's, it's a very exciting thing. And, 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 it's, and, and it's also leading joint venture discussions because obviously the, the, the expertise in building these wind farms is European. Uh, but you know, entering the U.S. market, it has its peculiarities: taxes, Jones Act, employment laws, uh, all kinds of things. And uh, you know, it's been great for us. It's been great for for the lawyers. Hopefully, it eventually is going to be great for the bankers and private equity and everybody else. Mm -hmm. So you're you're you think it'll happen? You're you're bullish. I mean, it's happening. Uh, I, it sounds like it it it'll definitely happen. Uh, yeah. You know it. Uh, sadly, it's become a little bit of a politicized issue. Uh, the example uh, is when Governor Christie was in New Jersey, there was an eight-year hiatus in New Jersey developing offshore wind. And then as soon as he was, as soon as he left, then New Jersey went back to, this is a great thing, we're going to do it. 
So, so those were in federal federal waters or state waters? Uh, well, the, the 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 states play a very active part because they're the ones that approve the purchase of the power. And in, in other words, they're they're you don't build a project to, to sell to, to to nobody. You sell it to a, a state, and right. and that and that and so the pull has to come from that end. The pull has to come from the Cuomos of the world and the like, who who set a target for renewable energy, and then and then back it up with a with with a with a purchase agreement. So. Um, and and you know and he, and 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 so the the states play a very important role, but the the actual permitting of the projects uh, done by the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management, BOEM, sometimes referred to as Bummer, um, you know they're they're they they've been without a political leader the entire Trump administration. Uh, there there's there there's you know and there and there and and there's fishing issues, fisher fisherman type issues, access issues. Uh, you know, it's not a simple thing to, to to block off square miles of the ocean, and you know, it, it interferes with things. It interferes with flights. It interferes with lots of things. So that's that all has to be sorted out, and it's taken a long time. But yes, I'm bullish that it will happen. Yeah, that's exciting. Kirk, are you seeing any capital uh, funding requests yet in that realm? Yeah, we, we've seen very few at this point. Um, you know, we expect it to accelerate, you know, and we, we're, we're looking at, at, at those opportunities. You know, if you think about wind offshore, you know, let's let's roll the clock back 70, 80 years. It's not unlike what happened with the, uh, you know, the oil uh, sector. You know, it started on land and, you know, again, being here in Texas, we've got wind farms, you know, all over the place. And, and it took a while for people and again, for for all the legal and, and political things to get through for those onshore farms to get established. And now they've kind of come mainstream, just like with the energy sector, you know, 80 years ago, it started dipping its toe in the water, pun intended there, and, and moving offshore. And I think you're seeing that same evolution now offshore. Uh, there's still a lot of political issues that have to be dealt with, a lot of legal issues, but I think it's going to come. And I mean, I think it'll be an area for opportunity for us. So, Yeah. And and, and Charlie, as you said, I mean, the expertise is, is elsewhere. So the potential for, uh, you know, foreign players to form partnerships and ventures and, and stuff, it seems really enormous. Yeah, I, I totally agree. And we've, we've worked on some, we've seen some, um it's 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 the obvious way to go i mean foss for yeah. example the big jones act company has entered into a, a, a jv with a big danish um company uh, you know it's 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 logical and it's the right thing to happen um look a lot um, for good or bad a lot can be done with a non-jones act vessel you don't need a jones act vessel to the insulin as long right. as you accept certain as long as you accept certain operational limitations, and right, uh, and there are and there are no U.S. flag vessels, Jones Act qualified or otherwise, that could do it. Same with yeah. cable lay, same with specialized rock dumping vessels, scour protection, and the like. Um, no SOVs. You know, people have talked about converting uh, idle oil and gas Gulf of Mexico assets. That may happen. Uh, I'm pretty skeptical about that, but that may happen. Uh, so we're talking about a fair amount of new construction um and um you know and, and and a pretty exciting market yeah no it's very it's very exciting and, it, and as you said on so many different levels we are I'm way beyond time here and i, I wish we weren't because i'd like to keep going and it's been a great discussion you know as i said at the outset it's um you know it's a this is a, a sprawling kind of complex u.s maritime and so it's hard to sort of get your arms around it in such a short period of time but you guys did a great job and i uh really appreciate your being with us today i'm there's still more questions that i haven't been able to answer i'm going to sort of process those post call and uh i hope we'll get together you know in person someday when it's safe and you know not before then but uh, we, we miss you guys. We miss all of you out there in the audience. And, and thank you for being with us today. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Matt. Bye, guys. Bye.